back with Grand Tactician Civil War CSA campaign. In the last episode, the Army of Kentucky... No, I'm getting them mixed up now. <laughs> Army of the Mississippi, uh, under, I believe, Fremont, uh, attacked Sterling Price's Army of Missouri in the vicinity of St. Louis. It was a, a successful battle, and Fremont was repulsed. As that episode ended, and we went back to the campaign map, and I ended the episode literally seconds after <laughs> I hit the stop recording button, uh, we got attacked again. Uh, the Army of Kentucky under Henry Halleck uh, reconstituted itself re reconstituted itself at Vandalia, Illinois and has come back across the Mississippi River and is attacking us at St. Louis. So this is now the third battle of St. Louis which is happening almost immediately uh, after the Second Battle of St. Louis. On the one hand, this is a good thing, because even though we have taken St. Louis, we have not yet flipped Missouri to secede and join the Confederacy. Because the other requirement for that strategic objective is to defeat all enemy armies in Missouri. So... If they keep attacking us here, at some point that particular objective should fulfill. The bad news is, even if Price wins pretty convincingly each individual battle, if they keep tag teaming and coming in one after another, you know, an army comes in, gets their butts kicked, retreats, but then the other one's ready to come back in. And while he's, you get the idea, if they keep hitting us quickly, then that will wear this army down. And uh, in fact, this, this battle occurred so quickly that I was concerned about, when the battle first popped, I was concerned about uh, Price's ammunition situation from the previous fight. However... Uh, take a look here in the report. This is the condition report. And we actually look like we're in pretty decent shape. 100% on uh, ammo. <clears throat> and and still, you know, this is the comparison of the two forces. And they're almost identical. Just a tiny, tiny bit on provisions and forage, and that's insignificant. I attribute that to we're sitting in St. Louis with a pretty big captured supply depot uh, supporting us. And our, uh, our morale is fine as well. Yeah, confident all the way across the board. Now the enemy has determined morale, which I think is one step up. I think top, I think, I, I don't know if I've ever seen a scale that, like, you know, that defines what these levels are, but uh, I think the top is eager, the next is determined, and then the third one down is confident. And co confidence fine. And I think that the reason why the Union has the better morale, the, overall their army morale across the board uh, in the campaign is, is lower than the Confederacies because we've been the one that have been uh, capturing cities and winning battles. However, because Missouri has not yet seceded, this is still considered Union territory. So they are getting... Let me make sure I say this correctly. We are still getting a nerf to our, you know, our morale is capped at a certain level uh, because we are fighting on enemy territory 
not defending our own. And the Union doesn't have that particular debuff. So, because they're essentially defending home territory. So that is why Halleck's, Halleck's army currently has a uh, higher morale. Let's see how that's reflected in the victory tooltip. It's just a little bit higher. 59 points compared to our 55. And we do own the objective. That's a factor. We got credit for 7 points for it. So what I would normally do or what I've been doing more recently in these videos is uh, I wouldn't have even shown this part yet. I would have just cut in on the battle after deployment and, uh, you know, kind of when combat's ready to start. I did get a comment, uh, a couple comments in earlier episodes recently saying, hey, um, really, really like your stuff. However, you're cutting out. <laughs> some of the stuff that I was hoping to to learn by watching these videos uh, kind of like for you to uh, kind of like to see some of that stuff so I'm not gonna do it every time I'm not changing kind of the way I, I do things but for this battle at least I'm going to go ahead and show all the boring pre stuff as well because some folks might find that uh, interesting and I'll tr even more I, I tend to talk a lot about uh, you know why I do what I do or at least I, I try to maybe I don't do it as much as I think I I am but I will try to articulate uh, as best I can what I'm thinking okay so let's look at the map here we have a meeting situation we have uh, however the one objective on the map uh, it did award control of that to us, which is why we have seven points already for the objective point. Now, <clears throat> I don't think that it, the objective points are really all that important for determining the battle outcome. The vast majority of these victory points come from uh, morale changes and routes and casualties. The objective points are usually, you know, if you look at the numbers in this particular tooltip that updates over time, the objective points, uh, the objective victory points are usually pretty, pretty minor uh, in that equation even when continuous victory points from objectives is turned on. And, it, and even less so in this campaign where I have those turned off. I, I just turned them off because I'd never done that before and I just wanted to see the difference, which frankly isn't all that much. Um, what is important about the objective points, however, is that looking at the overall situation the ownership and location of the objective points gives some pretty gives a pretty good clue on predicting what the AI is going to try to do. We own this point; it's the only one on the map, so it's uh, pretty solid that Halleck's army is going to march toward this objective point and attempt to capture it. He is starting at one of these three locations, no matter which one of those three he chooses. Um, at some point, he is going to take a route, he'll come down this road, or this road, or this road to this area, and then come right down this road into the objective. So I don't think I have to go out looking for him. Now, if he had more, ooh, he does have more spread out. He could be here. What would that route look like? I think he would come down this road. 
and then up this way. Okay, well, assuming that there is a basically a even chance, he's got four entry points. Um, so there's like a 25% chance he's going to come up from the south via this route here. Or possibly through this track, through the woods. Either way. Okay, uh, I am still going to kind of bank on him coming from the north this way. But I do have to have a plan B in case, it, you know, to address this particular route. Look at the map here. And this looks like a pretty obvious defensive position. There's a fence across the road here. And there is a stone wall here. Now, I don't think he's going to... I don't think he will cross and come down this way. However... A position here behind this stone wall is still, you know, still covers here in front along this road firing across the creek. So I think this position is kind of going to be my main position. And then as as we get the uh as we get the the clock rolling, you know, the cab will be out and and he'll He'll go out scouting and try to find where they're coming from. And what I'll do is I will fur I'll, I'll place Marmaduke like over here. I'll place the cab over here so that he will be able to rule out this start location quickly. Like almost immediately. If he's over here here, he'll he'll catch sight probably as soon as time starts rolling and then he can run up this road to uh, this area I think that'll work and then if they are over here there will be time to reorient the defense probably uh, probably along this creek maybe The other thing that he could do is cross through this area. There is a ford here. Take this route down, cross Proud Run here near the Davis place, and come at it from the other direction. But I think that is something that a maybe a human player would do. I don't think the AI will. Okay. As I said, I would normally cut all this part out. <laughs> but uh, this time, we're, you're going to get it all. Let's get prices and just plop them up here so I can see better what they're doing. Why is that? Okay. All right. So first things, let's just get the cab over where I said it was going to be. Marmaduke has developed into quite uh, an of... Quite an elite brigade. As a matter of fact, it, he may not be the only one I need to do this with. I need to actually... He picked up a perk slot in the last battle. Let's see what we got here. What's up with that? Why does cavalry only have one perk? I know that I've looked in the manual. There's at least six cavalry perks. Okay, something is bugged here. That's obviously not correct.
Okay, I am going to leave. That, that, that's not right. So I am not going to select that now. That, that may be something empty. Um, so, something's just not right there. So I'm not going to select anything from for now, and I will look at that again after another save game. And I'm also going to look at the manual to see if that icon matches to something. Oh, no, there we go. Okay. <laughs> well, that was weird. Okay, there's expert scouts, concealment 10%, level up by scouting. That is the primary way that I use the, the CAV, is the pre-battle scouting. So that is definitely a consideration. Melee strength, nah. I don't think he needs that. I really only use the melee sometimes during the pursuit phase, trying to just scam some low-hanging fruit casualties from a wavering or breaking unit. I, he doesn't need a buff for that. Mounted rifles. That is uh, that's a legitimate one. Worth worth considering. Allows running. Level up by fighting in loose order. Okay, that's a candidate. Vanguard. No morale hit if detached. The way I use cavalry, I don't think this is a necessary perk because, like, if if I had a separate cavalry brigade that was attached directly to the army command to Price without a division commander in between, that would be a good perk. It'd be a very good perk. Because you get that, uh, now it says here, if detached, right? Which is this little button here where you essentially detach them from the command of the army. That doesn't mean they completely do their own thing. The main effect of this detach order says will operate by itself, removed from the higher level formation. Um, but the main effect of this thing is... When you give a division-wide or an army-wide order, the detached unit doesn't follow it. And so a lot of times I will, you know, I've got an artillery battery in each one of the divisions. And a lot of times I will detach that battery, not because I intend to go send them off somewhere else necessarily, but mainly just because when the division commander orders the infantry brigades to do something, the artillery doesn't stop firing and, and attempt to match the order. You know, still keep them co-located. Just, I don't want the artillery following the infantry um, movements a lot of times. But the orders to that unit still come from the, the, the division commander immediately above it. So they're not just completely on their own uh, doing whatever the AI tells it to do. With my CAV, even if I just have the one brigade in an army like I have here in this army, I still have a division commander so that I can send the cav way off on other parts of the map. But with a division commander, I've still got a, a higher level commander in range. And while orders would take forever to get from Price to Van Dorn, I don't need to do that because I have Van Dorn right here to give orders to Marmaduke over a short distance and that keeps Marmaduke responsive and doing what I want him to do pretty quickly. And then I can just move, you know, sometimes it's weird. Sometimes the division commander will simply follow his subordinate unit around without you having to tell him to. And then other times he won't. And I have, I'm sure that there are 
reasons why that that occurs. I just haven't really sussed out what they are. In any case, I can see where that would be a useful perk. Um, but the way that I use Cav, I'm not, I don't think so. And then we've got Lightning Brigade. Cover plus 10% level up fighting from behind cover. Okay, that sounds pretty good, especially in a defensive situation. Um, in the last battle was a good example. Um, Marmaduke was sitting behind a railroad embankment during a hot part of the uh, battle, and he was in cover, dismounted. But I don't think so on this one either, for a couple of reasons. Number one, cavalry is about movement and firepower. And a lot of their utilization comes in during the pursuit phase of a battle. And that's a very fluid, you know, movement-oriented uh, phase of operations. And usually the concern is simply getting guns on target wherever you can. And considerations about cover go way way down. In the early phase of a battle, the initial stage where we're scouting, maybe delaying, it's the same thing. Movement more important than cover. You know, cavalry is not uh, a unit that that I use anyway to hold a defensive line for an extended period of time, which is where cover, you know, fences, walls, breastworks and you know I typically don't have cavalry in those kinds of positions very often. Occasionally, yes. Okay, so I'm going to... I mean, that, that would be a pretty good one for uh, an infantry brigade. And I think there is an infantry... There probably is an infantry perk pretty similar to that. So I'm not going to go with that. I'm not going to go with that. Um... Allows running. That's probably useful. <laughs> but I would probably just simply forget to use it. <laughs> you know, this, you know, getting anything out of this perk actually requires me to take an active action and remember to take it. And uh, I don't. It's not so much the perk. I just don't trust myself to really get much out of that. <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to pass on that one. And that leaves mounted rifles uh reload slow down while mounted minus 25%. It's kind of down to this uh, scouting one and the mounted rifles. Now for a lot of uh basically during the earnest combat, I will use that term. Um during the the longest phase in the the middle phase of the battle when we're doing the real fighting that would be pretty useful if i mounted cavalry during that kind of fighting i don't during that kind of fighting i almost always have the, the cav dismounted and But I do fire mounted a lot during the pursuit phase. Where basically I'm just trying to milk additional casualties to push us over the threshold for a major victory. Concealment when scouting. This, you know, anything that's related to firepower, you know, is is all is is usually pretty attractive. However, you know, the main reason why the the cab is in the army at all 
is for reconnaissance and scouting purposes. It's basically uh, one of his most important functions. This one's a little bit more boring, but that's the one I'm going to take. So, there was my convoluted uh, thought process and process of elimination on that. Let's just see if there's any other perks. I may not, I may not be able to award an army perk. I, I suspect Price has one open, but I can't do it here. Can I do it in the order of battle? Uh, no. Okay. Let's just double check all these. Okay. Clark has got a perk slot open. More engineering points. Construct and uh, increases the speed of digging in. There was a time I would not have considered that, but that's actually not bad, especially now that I've learned that uh, throwing up breastworks is pretty viable during the fight, not just before, during the deployment phase. That's a candidate. Sharpshooters is always a candidate, plus 10% accuracy. It's kind of like the cavalry one. Allows running. Well, <laughs> I've got a. I just don't know if I would do that very much. Now, there's a concealment one, level up by. That's a skirmisher one. Do you use skirmishers a lot? That's a candidate. No, not interested in melee. I just don't use that enough. This is a really good one, Deadly Volley. 50% uh, volley strength, uh, uh, no, 50% resistance to kind of uh, short-term casualties. And plus 5% volley strength. The issue with this one is short range. Well, basically I usually am firing at stuff in long range. And giving everybody rifles. The idea being, if the enemy does get to a short-range engagement, something is all has already gone a little bit wrong. And that's kind of my reservation on deadly volley. Like I could take this. Uh, there it is. I could take this one, but it wouldn't. It wouldn't level up to level two and level three very very quickly if at all because I usually try to arrange things so that we're dealing damage over medium and long ranges as much as I can whereas sharpshooter level up by engaging enemies at long range this will just kind of Level up naturally. So while the effect of this perk is very good, I just don't think it's going to level up very quickly. Not nearly as quickly as Sharpshooter or Iron Discipline, which we'll look at in a minute. Ace of Spades. Co yeah, okay, so the, this is the cover uh, perk for Infantry. And it's not just about entrenchments, breastworks, and parapets. The idea here is that the infantry improves its position in cover, in any kind of cover, along a creek, behind a fence, in the woods. And level up fighting from behind cover, well, I do that a lot. I try to do that a lot. You know, my, my kind of my basic philosophy of fighting these battles is I think anyone who's seen more than a couple of them readily see, or even just a couple of them readily sees you know I try to put infantry in cover and fight more or less defensively that's a strong candidate and iron discipline's a good one 
uh, cohesion increases faster and it's level it's leveled up by fighting in any kind of ranged combat regard you know regardless of distance so this is one that levels up pretty much just by doing normal stuff that they would do in any battle under pretty much any situation uh, and cohesion regain is important you you know you march troops especially through any kind of you know, forest or over a creek or over a ford, they lose cohesion. And you're trying to get them someplace, and then they got to sit there and kind of reorganize themselves for a little while. So this is a good one as well. There's several good infantry perks. I usually, in the past, I have usually taken Iron Discipline. But I think Ace of Spade is kind of a good default uh, perk that matches kind of the way that I tend to fight with the infantry. In this campaign, I think I'm going to I think I'm going to go with Ace of Spade as kind of my typical infantry uh, perk. Let's do it. Okay. With with one exception. Um, over in the Army of Northern Virginia, I do have a division of hall rifle armed infantry for those guys i will probably go sharpshooter wow these guys have been it makes sense that there's perks opening up in this army i think 80 percent of the fighting <laughs> in this campaign has been in missouri geez i think they've all they all got a perk in the last uh that except for except for Rose's division, which makes sense. Those were those two units were not in at campaign start. I think they missed the first couple battles. How about artillery? Does anybody have anything? No. I have found that artillery levels up a perk slot much slower than infantry does because all those various actions of how you increase perks <clears throat> are also the things you do to get XP toward a perk slot in the first place. And I don't know if we can look at the, yeah. So there was that, that last one, Iron Discipline, level up in ranged combat. So basically, infantry... And they, and then the other one for using cover. So using cover and just shooting levels, you know, helps open up perk slots. So infantry usually get it quicker than other units because artillery doesn't have anything like that. The default mode for artillery firing is fire at will, and fire, you know, there isn't a corresponding perk for that action. So when they're just shooting, firing at will, they're not building XP toward a perk slot. Counter battery fire and bombardment do count for that, which is why I've been trying to use bombardment more often recently. But even so, and you can even, it's hard to tell on this little rim, but not only have these, these uh, battalions not opened a perk slot, by looking at the rim, it doesn't look like they've it doesn't look like they're very close either. So okay, well, I burned a lot of time on that. This is probably going to be a long episode.
All right, um, let's put everybody in line. There we go. We'll put, uh, this terrain here for a second. So this is a little bit elevated back here. I think if we put the artillery kind of right in this area, you should have good shots at longer range anyway against uh, troops coming down this road. What I'm kind of thinking is Instead of putting the infantry right on the fence, maybe I put some breastworks back here. And then the skirmishers can push forward and use the fence. I think I like that idea. I'm going to do that. So let me put... Uh, I've got 11... We have 11 points here, which is good for breastworks. I would not be able to build much. Uh... Well, on the other hand, I don't really see where else I, I want earthworks. Let's see how much a parapet would cost. Okay. So I'm just going to put it right back here at just about the distance that skirmishers would be, you know, at a distance where when I push skirmishers forward, they ought to just naturally line up with that fence. So something about like so. It's good at long enough to, for two brigades to get in there. Maybe an artillery battery, although I've had trouble with that before. All relative to the way that you want the parapet facing, right? It, so toward this road, toward the north, always draw from left to right. And why is that? It was, it was okay a second ago. Oh, I, I think uh, I think that's the I think that's as much as you get with eleven points. I, I, I think that's what all that red is. It's not terrain. Okay. For the longest time, I, I had problems with uh, breastworks or parapets that were facing the wrong direction. And that's because I was drawing from right to left. <laughs> so left to right relative to the direction you want them to face. Okay. And we don't have enough points for... A very good parapet, so we'll just draw breastworks. I think that'll be fine. One thing about the parapets. Once you place the parapet, I, I don't think there's anything like this for breastworks, but when you place earthworks down, the parapets, after they're built, you, get, you can hover over it and get a little icon to improve the parapet. So the, the basic parapet you build is, is the earthwork with the little trench behind it. And then you can click it once and it'll put some obstacles in front of that parapet. And then you, then you can click it again and you get an additional line of obstacles out in front of it called abati, which are basically just out in front and slows movement down of any forces coming against you. My recommendation my, in my, my practice is don't do that. For some reason there's it appears there's some kind of little bug in the game or I don't know if it, I don't know if bug is the right word. But with improved parapets, something happens with the configuration of that 
object in the game that your troops then it's very difficult to get them to actually get into the parapet and get the cover bonus. And they may as well just be standing in open ground. Um, even just probably one of the most uh, widely watched uh, uh, YouTubers for this game uh, it, it's a it's a channel called History Guy Gaming. Um, that's the name of the channel. And uh, Chris, he has several channels. They're all very good. I recommend them. I've subbed to all his channels, and he's he's very good at this game. But just just today, he posted a, a battle. He was playing Confederacy. He was way outnumbered. He built uh, a lot of earthworks and initially his battle was going fantastic there was every indication that he would beat off a much larger union force uh it kind of looked like you know the mule shoe spotsylvania um and then on an overnight deployment phase he upgraded some of his entrenchments and as battle resumed on the morning of the next day he had just the the hardest time getting those guys to take cover in the trenches and it didn't work out and they they just got obliterated and it was because of that bug if he had been able if he had just left them alone and i am not criticizing him <laughs> at all he's he's i think he's probably a lot better at this game than i am but um He wound up losing the battle just because his his brigades under the most intense fire simply took too many casualties uh, because he he could not get them to take cover in those parapets anymore after he upgraded them. On the first day when they were just regular parapets, they did awesome and were sat in cover the whole time and they could rotate around to change their facing and they stayed in cover. Um... And so that's that's what kind of seems to happen is even if you upgrade the parapets later, say overnight, and there's already troops in them, and then you get time rolling, initially they will be still in the cover. But then, you know, they they react to uh, enemy movements, you know, and, and they'll turn their facing a little bit. In regular parapets, they may still get credit for cover. And even if they rotate too much and they don't anymore, it's not difficult to pop them back into cover. But once they're upgraded and they take themselves out of cover, good luck getting them back in. Uh, you probably won't. Anyway, enough on that. And not relevant here because I'm not using those. Okay, so let's get a... Uh, we'll take Johnson's division. We'll put him in the breastworks. There's actually room for three brigades there. So let's modify that a little bit. And I've told myself I'm not going to do this anymore, but I'm going to leave this uh, horse artillery here on the breastworks. And then let's get another... We'll get Rhodes's division. Let's put them here for now. We'll put one brigade here on this side of the breastworks. And I don't think I like the idea of putting a brigade on the other side of the run. Because I don't think... I think you can walk through a stream this size without a ford. 
but very, very slowly with a huge amount of fatigue and loss of cohesion. And of course, very vulnerable to fire. So I'm not a fan of putting a brigade over here, but I might. I do want skirmishers on this stone wall, though. So I'm going to put this, I'm just going to kind of put them back just a little bit, right about here. And we will send this brigade skirmishers up to the stone wall. And then, so the question is, if artillery is sitting right in here, will they be able to fire over? I kind of doubt it. Well, I think I may have messed up this defensive position for the simple reason that I haven't left any place for my artillery to shoot from. Right in here would be pretty good for the for the initial federal approach. But then they're going to have to bug out from that and they don't have a good place to bug out to. This is kind of a little bit of a rise here. They could pull back to here, perhaps. So what we can do, I got a little bit of engineering points left. So how about, kind of as an initial position, I think they're getting some line of sight. One criticism I have with this game is that the, the firing arcs are awfully difficult to see most of the time. Just the color of them. Yeah. The critical stretch of the road is not really open. They can't really see into here. And I'm going to have to pull them back pretty early. And they have to go through woods as they retreat. That's, yeah, I'm not going to do that. Okay. I am uh, not optimistic that they're going to have line of sight. Oh, maybe so. That looks unobstructed. We'll see how they do from there. Okay. And then that leaves uh, Reigns' division as kind of a reserve. They can kind of uh, move over here and support this flank, which is kind of anchored in the woods. Or they can they can come over. Anyway, something comes up where it's you know you kind of want some infantry available to do something, and that's going to be Reigns' job as it was in the last battle. 
and we'll uh, so I'm going to detach his artillery. I'm actually going to detach all the horse artillery. And we'll just put that one battery up with uh, Huger, about like so. Let's detach this one. And this one. And where do I want this battalion? I guess I'll just put him here with the other artillery. I don't really see any other good positions for it. We do have the one battery up on the line. Which may mean he draws a lot of fire. And then as soon as time starts rolling, uh, we're going to send skirmishers forward. And they're going to take cover here along the fence and the stone wall here at this little fort. So with that, I thought I had already moved Marmaduke. No? Okay. Or Van Dorn. As soon as we get a moment off camera <laughs> over the winter, uh, this is uh, an Arkansas, I think. No, this is a Missouri Cavalry Brigade. I think I'm going to recruit a small Missouri Cavalry Brigade if the size of the volunteer pool allows it. Put them into this army, not as a separate unit, but to um, bring this unit up to strength. It has to be Missouri troops. You can't combine uh, units from different states. Uh, if they're if they're volunteers with draftees, I think you can. Because <clears throat> this is a very good unit, they've done a fantastic job, and the only thing better than an elite unit is a big elite unit. <laughs> so that may dilute his XP a little bit, but it'll still be a great unit. I don't know if it will. I just, you know, it would make sense if it did. If we go from a thousand really experienced men to over two thousand, uh, not, you know, where half over half of them are newbies. We'll see how that works out. And then we'll just move Price up a little bit closer to his subordinate commanders. Okay, let's get uh, time rolling. these skirmishers out. If I gauge the distance well enough, maybe they'll just go right into the cover without me having to tell them to. This one I'm going to have to tell them to go up to the stone wall. No, not that stone wall. The other one. Come on. Crap. Fine. That stone wall. Okay, let's get Marmaduke looking for Federals. Get his scouts out. Let's, I think if there were... Uh, I always do that. It puts scouts out and it puts their icon right on top of the cab. So when you click, it almost always picks them up. I feel like if there were Federals over here, he would have already seen them.
Yeah, he's not coming from that way. So let's just run up this road to check this location. I could, if there were reinforcements coming for the Federals, I would run Marmaduke over here to grab possession of this road and block it. He doesn't have reinforcements coming. It's not worth spending the movement time to do that. Yep, they're the, okay. All right, so here's our first sighted uh, federal unit, and actually the cavalry is not who found them. If he makes a left turn, it means that their route is going to be down this track, like so. Let's just advance time a little more and see which way he turns. That's what they're doing. Okay. Well, so this defensive line just became uh, obsolete. They're actually going to come around here and come up from the south. We got a creek. That's not terrible. And there's some nice high ground here for artillery. But it's set back a ways. Okay, I'm going to take this infantry. Uh, we'll take uh, Rhodes' division. Let's tell him to come over here. I'm going to leave. No, I'm not going to do that. I want Johnson 
on the line of the expected attack because these are the two biggest brigades. This is this is the biggest uh, division. So let's put Johnson about here. Let's take the artillery, get them turned around up on this little bit higher ground. Let's re let's put reins back kind of here, get him a little bit out of the way, maintain his reserve position, but then he can also be present to quickly man this line again if if they do come more in this direction. They usually all stay together in these smaller armies. There's really not that many brigades in their whole army, just like there's not many brigades in ours. But sometimes, just pathfinding one of the brigades or one of the divisions may decide that they want to take an alternate route. They may be going to the same place that the AI ordered them, ordered everybody else to go. They just took a different route. That happens. We saw that in the last battle as well. Okay, and then we need to get the cav headed back toward the army. Let's see if uh, maybe from this ridge we can see the rest of the brigades. Okay. Porter was in the last battle. So either that is a different Porter, which it could be, I think there were more than one Porter, or this brigade has been transferred from the Army of the Mississippi. Porter and Sykes. Well, that's interesting. So you kind of, you know, so the cav and the infantry all come down here, but this battery commander decides he's going to take a different, uh, a different route. Oh, those skirmishers did not come with the uh, their parent brigades because I had moved them a little bit, which actually kind of works out. They can. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they can probably deal with that battery over there. Where's Reigns? Just in case another unit comes with uh, that battery stayed there. I think those skirmishers can deal with that battery on their own. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna react to that. Yeah, change his mind. Is that it? I feel like there's probably more federal units than that. There may yet be another division coming this way. I think it's time to go to 1x. Okay. Let's get Allegheny Johnson 
I think that's Allegheny Johnson. I hope I don't have the wrong Johnson. Let's get him into the creek cover. And I would say put skirms out, but he's already got skirms out. They're up on the other fence line. And let's get uh, roads on the creek. And I think we have an opportunity here for Marmaduke. If I can click him, there we go. Pull your scouts in and Go attack that battery. Halt. I don't want him to walk face first in a canister. Okay. Dismount. Loose order. Now I go over there. Let's just get these guys to pull their skirms back in. They're not going to do anything back there. I think I may have pulled in the skirmisher, skirmisher that was chasing that artillery unit. I thought I had told him to dismount, did I not? I guess the movement order probably cleared that dismount order. Engaged over here now. They're loading up on Slack, who I thought I thought I had given all these perks out. Oh, apparently assigning perks uh, in the deployment phase doesn't work. It did for these guys. Hopefully Cheatham stays in cover there as he rotates. He does. That's good. He's delivering flanking fire on this uh, dismounted calf here. Bushrod Johnson is not fully in position yet. I can't rotate him yet.
Loose order. Shoot. Shoot the arty. I don't like Slack not being in cover there. He's already taking some casualties. Where's Reigns? Where is Reigns? Kind of lost track of. Where do those go? Oh. Oh. Wow. Given the smaller size of that army, that is a big difference in their routes. Okay. That was unexpected. Okay. What do we do about this? Well, first things first, at least just rotate so you're not taking fire in the rear. And we need to bring Clark over here on Waitman's flank. He's on a fence there. That's, that, this is not ideal. That's too close. They're just going to block each other. Let's bring them about like this for now. And move quickly. Don't advance. An advance order means they're going to move to that position, but along the way, they they will fire. If they're going straight forward, that's you know that's a pretty typical command to use. But something like this, we want them here as quickly as possible. With the advance command, he'd move a little bit, and then he'll stop, rotate, and start and try to fire. But if Waitman is standing here. A lot of Clark's fire doing that might get blocked by the friendly brigade. So that's why I'm using the, it's charge, but basically it's a move here quickly order. Or really more of a move here without doing, doing anything else order. Okay, so that's the immediate reaction. They're going to need help over there. Um... I think I need to leave both of these brigades in position in uh, Rhodes's division. I don't want to move Cheatham's brigade. He's delivering flanking fire from cover. Pierce, however, is not really a part of that battle just yet. Why in the hell does he have an order to go over here? That may be commander initiative deciding to address this artillery. I think Marmaduke's got that. He doesn't need to respond to that. So, first thing we need to do is give Pierce a halt. Turn that gunfire down a little bit. And now, let's tell Pierce to come here. I don't want to make that a retreat order. That might give him a morale debuff. Actually, let's tell... I don't usually do this a lot, but let's tell Pierce to double time. Okay, that artillery brigade is broken. Let's get uh, 
Get Marmaduke remounted. Get him over here to help out on the unexpected attack. Yeah, see, these guys came over quicker than they might have otherwise. These are just... I, I, at first I thought that was part of this brigade. <laughs> they were getting all this... That's, a, that's skirmishers returning to their brigades. Okay, Marmaduke, get down here. Okay, there's some routed Union Cavalry. That's, oh, Slack, uh, Slack also retreated though, or routed. Okay, we're gonna have to get Johnson over here. Deliver flanking fire on the first brigade. Okay, so we've got three brigades over here now. Let's get this battery limbered up. over here. Maybe not not by that route. <laughs> yeah, okay. Go there. Pretty hot little firefight going on right here. Which so far, Cheatham is getting the better of it. Bushrod Johnson is coming over to assist with that. And hopefully, they can break this unit before this unit here becomes a problem. Okay, Waitman is broken. Not gonna lie, this isn't going too hot. Well, for a second, I thought that was Marmaduke. That's that's Federal Cavalry. Where is Marmaduke? He's coming. Okay. Okay, this is the let. Well, yeah, no, there's still two unbroken brigades here. Once they deal with these guys, then they can run over here to help. Is that battery? Where's that battery at? Pierce is doing fine. Clark is doing not so fine. Let's just move Clark back just a little bit so that this other... That's not an advance. But Move these guys a little bit over this way so they have a clear field of fire.
Pierce did not get cover credit here. That's unfortunate. How is this going over here? Come on, Johnson. Now. Long range. Jeez. Cav, dismount. Loose order. I just saw a pop up here, I think, of Federal Brigade just routed. Hopefully it's that guy over on the creek. I'm gonna get up in here. First Brigade cannot last much longer. How is... <clears throat> He's taking some losses. About halfway on his uh, loss resilience. I don't really understand why... Let's try to take that flanking fire debuff off by rotating him just a little bit. Didn't work. Chris is doing a good job here. I hope he keeps it up because if he breaks, this whole thing's going to un completely unravel. the rate of fire of these burnside carbines uh, make short work of this guy. Looks like they're starting to retreat. Okay, that unit broke. Rotate. A little toasty. Just leave these guys in cover. We're just about there. I don't know why. Clark is just about to break. Major victory. 2,800 casualties, 23% of the force. We've taken almost 2,000 ourselves. This is, this is definitely the closest battle that the Army of Missouri has yet fought in this Missouri campaign. Yeah, I'm not I'm not pursuing. We already have the major victory. <laughs> and uh we're not that far from our own threshold. Cuz it's not just how much you inflict on the enemy, it's also if we reach 23%, then we would lose the major victory and it would flip back to a minor. And it, whether they're retreating or not, these unbroken units, you do engage them, well, they'll engage back. 
and uh, Marmaduke's Cav is really the only viable unit. Once you, once you get in the pursuit phase, you know, the infantry is just not going to move fast enough to really do much more once enemies are out of range. So it's really just the Cav, and I'm not going to take a chance on messing up and, and losing more uh, troops out of Marmaduke's brigade. So I'm just going to go 10x and we have successfully defended St. Louis yet again. But winning a bunch of battles like this one is a good way to lose a war. I just completely did not see that half of Halleck's army would detour and come around this way. Just did not see that coming. I thought that they would all stay together. At least the bulk of them. Came up in the rear, and it was Reigns' division that paid the price for that. Waitman broke entirely, and... Who's this? And Clark came within a hair's breadth of breaking. And they both took significant losses. I may have to combine those brigades. We're recruiting uh, units down at the uh, Confederate HQ at Montgomery. Oh, why am I... Paused. And my idea there was I was just going to put a brigade apiece to build out the all the four. I think I'm going to take several of those units and bring them to this Missouri Army. Since they seem to be doing the most fighting, at least for the time being. Take a look at the returns here. Okay. So they dealt about 2,000 casualties. It, it, it's always round numbers for the enemy side because th these are estimates. So it's estimated they dealt 2,000 casualties, which seems weird. It seems like that would be an exact number from the returns, from the units. Seems like we would know exactly how many casualties they inflicted, because they're us. Yeah, I think Reigns probably received worse than they gave. They, they, uh, they inflicted 600 casualties but they took 841. Johnson's division did the most damage. Artillery, 82. Yeah. 373 for the Cav. Which really wasn't that engaged that long. He broke up that little artillery battery and then ran over to help on the flank. So the combat he did was good, just there wasn't, neither one lasted very long because his rate of fire, you know, broke the enemy unit quickly. Okay. Okay, I didn't really keep track, however, that was probably a pretty long episode since I uh, did all of the pre-deployment and so forth. And... Uh, Let's just see coming out of this if that did the trick for getting our Missouri objective done. Van Dorn picked up fame. Makes sense. The Cav has done well in this army. Oh, and General Slack got defamed because of his route. Yeah, I don't know if he deserves that, but...
And because that casualty rate wasn't nearly as lopsided as it has been on the previous battles, the national morale and military experience uh, movements weren't nearly as big. Okay, well, you know, losing 2,000 men out of an army this size is not great. Engineers, yeah, other side of this little river is where I want him to build that telegraph station. Anyway, uh, there you go. The third <laughs> Battle of St. Louis. Who knows how many more there, were, there will have to be. Uh, and that will do for this episode. Thank you very much for watching.